Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dean Rogers. Welcome back to the Dean Rogers Show. Today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Chris Chico. What's up, Chris? What's going on? Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be here with you. Dude, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Uh, When I first got started, you were one of the main guys uh, that I started to learn and pick stuff up from. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, man. Well, I'm excited. And uh, I love hearing that because, uh, you know, hey, uh, the great thing about what I do and when we teach people is just we get we get we get an opportunity to to just uh, on the way of success. You have one hand up on the ladder, but you have one hand down to help somebody else up. And so the fact that you're telling me that warms my heart. So thank you very much for letting me know that. I love that. That's such a great way to think about it. So uh, for those of you that don't know Chris and you've been living under a rock, uh, Chris has been around since about 2003, started out with wholesaling, and then he started to venture into virtual wholesaling. I'll let you share all the details about uh, your journey and everything like that, but pretty much earned yourself the title of the godfather of virtual wholesaling. Um, and you implemented all these creative different types of strategies that that you'll be sure to share um, that were pretty much like pioneering the space, you know, and then, um, then you started to get into digital marketing, which has really become your, your genius and, uh, where you're, um, helping a lot of other investors as well. So if you guys want to connect with Chris, you guys can do that on all sorts of different platforms. You can go to chrischico.com spells it C R I S chico.com. We'll have that up on the screen. Of course. You can Google him, check out his YouTube page, check him out on Instagram, all the different platforms. So make sure you connect connect with Chris. Always coming out with great stuff. I think you always have to be a student willing to pick and pull new pieces of information. Chris is always on the cutting edge of, of new things. So Chris, let's jump into it, man. Let's talk about how you got started, your journey, and then we'll we'll dive into what you're most passionate about now. Yeah, so I started. I started. My journey started out just because for everybody that doesn't know, if you can tell my accent, I'm from Puerto Rico. So I grew up in Puerto Rico, came here to the U.S. and uh, you know lived on welfare and food stamps. And my motivation was that I wanted to make a lot of money. That was it. And so <laughs> I was trying every which way. I did MLMs. I did all kinds of crazy stuff. And eventually, uh, by luck, I ventured into real estate. I was initially a real estate agent. You don't have to be a real estate agent to do what we do. And then um, I ended up, uh, uh, I don't, uh, I, I didn't mention this in my bio, but I ended up being an REO agent, meaning that I was oh. selling properties for the banks. And one of the person, one of the investors that was buying, buying most of my deals, he said, hey, why don't you come work for me and I'll teach you the ropes. Love it. And I was like, teach me the ropes around what? And I didn't even know what he was doing. And he's like, I'm doing this thing called wholesaling. I'm like, okay, I'll take a chance on it. So I spent a year with him. And then uh, during that time, I had this crazy idea we were buying, we were buying, I was helping him buy properties from the banks. And then I had this crazy idea that maybe we can find motivated sellers through, uh, off market. Nobody mm-hmm. was doing that. And then, uh, there was, you know, nowadays it's easy to go out and get a list. Back then it was very difficult to go out and get a list of properties. Yeah. Um, and so I figured out a way to get a list of, um, a list of motivated sellers. Uh, let me turn on my, my thing went off a list of motivated sellers. Um, and then I went on my own and, you know, I was trying a, a bunch of different ways in, in, in order to, to get access to these people. And I, I, I ventured down the, the path of learning a direct response marketing from a guy named Dan Kennedy. And I used that in order to create my first set of postcards, which I'm known for. And so, you know, the way it started is, uh, you know, back then, we didn't have, uh, you know, there was a lot of things we didn't have. So, for example, we didn't have CRMs back then. You know, everybody has a CRM. You know, you put your leads in and everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started running postcards. And um, we were getting so many leads. Like, we would mail out a 1,000 postcards, and we would get, like, a like a 10% response rate. We couldn't even handle it. And we had to figure out a way so to, <laughs> how do we handle all those calls coming in? Because nobody was mailing back then. And so I was like, i got to figure out a way. So I figured out back then nobody was doing it. I said, oh, what if we have a 24-hour recorded message? And they just call that number because when the postcards went, you know, landed, the calls were coming so rapidly that even if you wanted to pick up the phone, you couldn't pick up the phone and all the calls that were coming in. And so that's how I kind of came up with the whole idea of 24 recorded messages. And back then, my CRM was I had a guy, the mail would hit on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I had a guy would come to my house with a notebook 
And he would sit there and handwrite all the messages. And then we had another guy that picked up the notebook to call all the sellers. That was our our our, our very sophisticated system. So I did direct mail, uh, mailed millions of postcards. For some of you that if you're into real estate investing, wholesaling, you may have heard of the, the third notice uh, postcard, the property notification. It. Okay, so I was the one that invented uh, that postcard. I call it Skip Tracing 1.0 because there was no script tracing back then. And I was like, you know, if only I could get the phone number of these people. And I had this crazy idea, but a 24-hour recorded blind message, meaning that it's just baited people to call that number. And uh, I have a lot of news articles from people that were very upset about getting those postcards. I never <laughs> raised my hand and say it was me that, that was mailing those. And then uh, I was mailing a lot of postcards. We had a mailing company back uh about 2014, uh, helping investors with that. But then I noticed that things were slowing down with direct mail. We weren't getting the response. And I had another crazy idea. The crazy idea was I thought that we could find motivated sellers on the internet. What? Believe it or not. Yeah, I know. Possible. <laughs> so so I I figured, hey, why don't we try it? So uh, through a lot of trial and error, I ventured into Facebook ads, you know, and, and, and people were doing PPC, but nobody was doing Facebook ads. And I said, you know, hey, maybe maybe we can figure out how to make this work. So through trial and error, I was the first guy that ever uh, created and pioneered uh, using uh, Facebook ads to find, to find motivated sellers. This was around 2016, 17. And then now our whole business is we are uh, we're currently we're doing the also, I have a small team, I have an acquisition disposition and two salespeople, and we are currently doing deals, and uh, all of our deals come from inbound marketing. Now, the tweak to that, to what we're doing is that, whereas before, you know, virtual wholesaling, when I pioneered that, it was like, hey, I'm in Miami, I'm going to do deals in Texas, I'm going to do deals virtually, you know, but I'm still picking that one location. The distinction with what I do now is that we're doing deals across 15 states. So with Facebook ads, rather than marketing to one particular area, we're just marketing a large geographic region. And now the leads, we're doing deals as the leads come in. Many times in, in small little towns with population sizes of five to 10,000, uh, where we didn't even know that the town existed until the lead came in. And, um, <laughs> and that's what we're doing right now. And, and, uh, no more direct mail. And that's kind of like my journey of just, you know, I've, I've, I've always, I always say this, I'm not the best real estate investor. In other words, if you and I go to toe-to-toe, uh, now you're, you're a big guy, so you, you, we wouldn't want to go toe-to-toe anyway. But if we went to toe-to-toe in real estate, you would win. Why? Because I don't, I don't know a whole lot of things about real estate, but I know one thing, and that is marketing. And that was the thing that I want to make sure everybody understands, that if you know how to market it, you know how to find leads, then it makes life much easier when it comes mm -hmm. to doing real estate investing and doing wholesaling and implementing a lot of the strategies that I teach and that you teach as well. I couldn't agree more that, that when I first got started and cut my teeth on wholesaling, that's what I realized really quickly is you control how many deals you're going to do based on the amount of marketing you're doing and how well you're yes. doing that marketing. 100%. And the other thing that's true is something that works today won't always work tomorrow. So you have yes. to continue to innovate and be ready to adapt and adjust to what's working and what's not. And if you don't, then you're going to get left behind. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And the other thing I would, I would add to that is you got to pick something that fits your personality and what you want to do. Meaning that I, I, I don't like being on the phone. I, you know, so for me, like if you told me, Chico, you're going to make a career out of real estate by being on the phone all day long, cold calling, I'd say, I'm going to go into the middle of the drive and into the middle of the highway and just run and try to hopefully have a car take me out of my misery because that's not what I want to do. And so I've always been a fan of inbound marketing, right? So I like people that submit a form or reach out when we were doing postcards, raise your hands and say, I'm interested in selling my property. Could you please have a conversation with me? And so, uh, you know, that that's, that's the thing that also resonates with me. I, I, I was when I first started, I did a technique that worked horribly, and that I don't know if you've ever heard of this, this technique. It's called door driving. Have you ever heard of this technique, door driving? Mm -mm. Yeah, I, I know you have it. So you've heard of door knocking. Door knocking was when you get a list of property owners, and then you like door, knock on the door and say, "Hey, yep. I think yep. you're in foreclosure, and maybe I could help you." Door driving is when you're too chicken to knock on the door, and so you just drive by, and then you just keep on driving, and you never <laughs> knock on any of the doors. 
<laughs> horrible, Tempe. Don't try effective. that. It never works. Yes. <laughs> very horrible. <laughs> That's hilarious. It oh. doesn't work 100% of the time. No, it doesn't work 100% of the time. By the way, you have to excuse me because I've had a vast amount of cough, uh, caffeine today and lots of energy pills. So that's why I'm, you know, you're, you're uh, bouncing to off the walls. Yes. <laughs> also because you're Puerto Rican, right? You just naturally talk faster. Yeah, no, I talk fast. And I, I would say a joke that some of my find offensive is that I'm Puerto Rican. So if you and I were together, I'd just steal your wallet. Just kidding. That's uh, <laughs> I can only say that because I'm Puerto Rican, so I could make fun of myself. You can get, that you can way. get yeah. away with it, yeah. Yes, yeah, but I don't carry a switch plate, so don't fear. Nice. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think what's what's interesting about what you've been able to do is grab people's attention. That's one thing that I noticed with your marketing, you grab people's attention. I think that's a yes. good sign of any good marketer. I know even down to, I, I love it. I just like to search your name into Instagram. Like I just tagged you right now that we're on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And just looking at the picture of your face that you have for your profile picture, I love <laughs> yes. it. Yes. Just your face. It's so animated. <laughs> yes. It's attention yes. grabbing. Um, just down to those little things. So what is yes. it about you? It, yeah. Go ahead. You, you tell I, me first. I was going to say, I call it my YouTube face, which my family hates because now automatically as soon as it's like family photo i do that that face like that and then yeah. my family's like don't do that anyway yes go <laughs> ahead <laughs> so how did how did you learn how to grab attention were you just naturally uh, a marketer growing up did you go to school for it did you have a mentor how did you no. learn how to, to grab people's attention i learned i learned really because of dan kennedy uh, Dan Kennedy is one of those old school, crusty uh, marketing guys. And I had followed back at the time, I was following a guy named Craig Proctor, who's a real estate agent. He's still a real estate agent. And then he had mentioned a guy named Dan Kennedy as his mentor. And I'm like, who is this guy? I want to know who this guy is. And I, I bought a book called The Ultimate Sales Letter. That was the first book I ever, I ever, I ever bought um, in, in terms of direct response marketing. And I sat down with that book and I used it to craft my sales letter, uh, my, my postcard, excuse me. And so to me, it was a learned, it was a learned skill, you know, meaning that it's just, and I think that's important for people to realize is that, uh, you know, there's a formula to apply with all these things. There's a formula to apply when you're putting together a postcard and you're putting together an ad on Facebook that you can apply that formula and then have, and then have reliable, reliability of results around what you're doing. And that is through learning direct response marketing. And direct response marketing is a little bit different than regular marketing. A lot of us think about marketing when they think about brand mark, brand building and, you know, Coca-Cola billboards and stuff like that. Direct response marketing for everybody who's, uh, who doesn't know is just, it, it's, it's an advertisement that you're creating specifically with the intent of having that other person that sees that advertising, uh, advertisement to take a very specific action. And that means that also keep in mind is this is what I've also uh, figured out <clears throat> is that when you learn direct response ar advertising, it, it forces you to learn what motivates people. You know, the motivation behind what they do. If I want to get a seller to, uh, to, 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 um, submit their form, then I need to know what their pain points are. Well, what are the things that they're trying to accomplish? All of that also helps when it comes to sales. Because I found that then when speaking with a property owner, uh, then all of those things that you learn about the direct response marketing immediately become applicable when you are on the phone with a seller and trying to deal with a prospect because you have to still come in with that mindset of understanding what their pain points are, what their motivations are in order to get them to take that next action with you. Yeah. So from what you learn and what you apply, what's your process? Cause I'm curious. I'm like leaning in. I want to know like, what's the secret. I, I got something I need to work on. What, what are the steps that I take? What's like that formula that you kind of have to start from top to bottom? Um, That's a good question. So I would say I would start off with, Understanding, uh, having a deep understanding of who the avatar is. Now, in real estate, for example, you know, we have different avatars. You have the broad avatar, which is a person that's just interested in selling the house for cash. But then you have sub avatars, like, for example, the landlord. So I think, you know, depending on the nature of the type of advertising that you're doing, if you're targeting a list, for example, then uh, really getting deep down, deep down into the psychographics of that particular individual. 
and 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 putting yourself in their shoes like um you know chat gpt as you know right now is hot so that's a great resource for using that tool in order to unearth uh those those but you know the easiest way here's a th- here's a, the shortcut really find stuff that's already working that's always the best see i did it sometimes i've done it the hard way and 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 i spend a lot of money in testing and tweaking but for mo- for almost 99% of you the path has already been cleared in front of you there's no reason to reinvent the wheel you can always it's always a much easier uh methodology to just take something that's already working and tweak it now it's great to have an understanding of direct response marketing principles so that you understand why that ad works right uh but the best thing is to take you know if you look at my postcard and you understand you, you read the postcard then you say you would read dan kennedy's book which now gives you the understanding of why that works and then the, the the most important thing I think is just understanding that the avatar that that person on the other side. Number two, very very being very clear about the 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 next action you want them to take, right? So because a lot of times people with their advertisements, it's not very clear in terms of what do you want them to take. Like for example, I'll give you an example. If I send a postcard to a property owner, they they the this me asking them for a decision for them to sell their property to me is not the right call to action. Why? Because we're not even at that stage yet. If I'm sending a postcard, think about it. When I, when I was doing the, the, the postcard, the, the blind copy, what is the next action that I wanted them to take? The next action that I wanted them to take was just to pick up the phone and dial mm-hmm. the number. Now the whole postcard is engineered around getting them to call the number. Now when they call the number and they listen to that recording, what is the next action that I wanted to take? So really looking at it from that perspective, because a lot of times... I've seen letters where you're trying to convince the property owner to sell you the property for cash on the letter. That's never going to happen. What you want them to do is what is that next step? And most of the time it's just the next step is you getting on the phone with them. And the same thing applies when like, if you're having uh, if you're trying to create a seller script and you're having a conversation with a seller, you know, you, you're you getting on the phone with a seller and you think, Oh, my objective is, you know, I'm going to get them to sell me my house. Well, Yes, big picture, but initially the objective is I need to make sure that they feel comfortable with me in the first five minutes in the conversation so they feel that I'm the person that's going to help figure out the problem for the property. Then once we get past that, then we go to the next step. So I think that that's one of the things that I'm always mindful of. Yeah, that's that's important. You got to understand who you even want to market to. So you said something interesting there is to use the the path has already been cleared. Use someone else's uh, material. Right. How do you know which one's going to work or not? Because I think you're right. If you want to get into direct mail, if you want to send out emails, if you want to do, um, uh, shoot, you know, lots of other different online digital ad and copy, there is so much out there. How do you sort through to figure out which one's probably the best? Um, I think there's only two ways, right? One way is obviously to to know for a fact that because I say you're talking, you're talking to a mailing house, for example, it's either direct, indirect, or your own personal knowledge. Direct is I talk to you and you say, this postcard is killing it, Chico. You are a dumb ass if you don't mail this postcard. Okay, that's direct. He's telling me it's working. If I talk to a mailing house and they say, we're mailing 2 million of these every single month, I'm like... Well, they got to be working because otherwise you're going to be, no, nobody would mail that many of them and that would mail them consistently, right? So that's kind of like indirect. Then the other part of it is the only way you could really know is like I, because of, of my knowledge of direct response, I could look at something and at least have an idea of whether or not it has a chance of working, right? Right from the get go. If I look at your, if you, if you're say you have a landing page and you're sending traffic uh, from Google paper, click or Facebook and you say, Hey, what do you think about this landing page? Even before you run an ad, I can probably tell you if, it has a chance and how on working or not. Um, so those are like the three ways to know the easiest is just direct, right? It's just, you figure out what's working and, and then you just duplicate that. Uh, but it also helps for you to not learn, learn and understand the principles because that's where the iteration comes in, right? Uh, that's where you can now take something. I can take somebody that, that's working for you and uh, I can, I can modify it slightly. And now I've come up with something completely brand, brand new and different that nobody's ever used before, but it requires those foundational principles initially. So I, w- I want to shift gears and talk about something that you're doing right now, which piqued my interest the last time we spoke. And that's an iteration on what you're doing with the digital marketing through Facebook. You're doing it across 
not one area, but many areas. Mm -hmm. And you're also targeting smaller cities. So the first question I have is what region are you focused on? And do you think that region is going to performs better or it's because you're more knowledgeable about that area. So what, what kind of, you said across 15 different States, what, what is that yeah. general geographical region? Well, if you look at uh, the best, best, uh, if you look at a map of the United States of America at night and you look for the light, you'll notice that the majority, the, the, the majority of the population resides in a very, very specific amount of States. That's what you target. Like if you think about Montana, and I've I've never I've not been to Montana. I know maybe you look down on me because I've never been to Montana. All my kids always want to go to Europe and all these fancy places. I tell them let's go to Montana. They're like, no, we're not going there. But if you look there, there's like one uh, one or two bliss, towns, and then there's like ba- there's like nothing at night. So we, sp- we we you just focus on the areas that have a large population. Now what happens? Let's take an example: Texas. Texas large population state. What happens though is. <clears throat> If we only decided or only going to uh, market in Dallas, only going to market in in in, in uh, Houston, then you're competing with everybody else because everybody else wants a wants a deal there. So what we do with Facebook is we just target the entire state. And now the best analogy I can give is like it's 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 we're asking Facebook for Marshall's inventory. You ever you ever been to Marshall's? I'm not going to hold it against you if you have. Uh, do you shop at Marshalls? Okay, not not saying there's anything wrong with it. I've been forced to go to Marshalls. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the way. But let's say let's say I wanted to buy a shirt, a Giorgio Armani shirt, and I I knew I wanted a black Giorgio Armani shirt. I'm going to go to the mall, and you know what? That's going to happen at the mall. I'm going to pay the highest price possible at the mall. Why? Because that's a shirt I want. But let's say that I said I just want a black shirt. I don't care what brand it is, and I go to Marshalls. I might find a Giorgio Armani shirt. Or I might find a you know another type of shirt, but it's black. That's a, kind of like the same analogy. Houston's is like Giorgio Armani. I say to Facebook, I want a Giorgio Armani shirt, and Facebook, Facebook, Facebook is going to say, well, "You got it," but we're going to charge you a lot of money for that because it's going to take a lot of ad spend in order for you to find a deal there. But I'm doing is I'm telling him, just I want the whole state. Sometimes you'll you'll they'll give me a lead in Houston. But many times they'll give me a lead in a lot of these other towns that nobody else is targeting, but they're viable. So I'll give you an example. We recently did a deal a deal in Midland, Texas. Uh, maybe I'm geographically challenged, but I never heard of Midland, Texas before. Have you heard of Midland, Texas Actually before? Have. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard okay. of the city. I've, I've never heard of that place is. before. I couldn't tell yeah. you where it is on the map, but I've heard of it. A lead came in, never heard of it, oh, no. but we did, a, we did a deal there. You see, it's between Waco and between um, Austin. Okay, that's Austin, why. Texas. Right. I was I was yeah. looking in those areas, and that's that's yeah. how I heard. So it. it's in around that area, but you know, most investors are not going to you know say, "Oh, I'm going to market in Midland, Texas." So we got a deal there, and I think we made like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on the deal because uh, it's in a smaller area. Its population size is much smaller than all the me- large metro areas, but it's it, but there's still a lot of activity in that town, and so that's those are the kind of leads many times that we're getting. Um, and, 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 yeah, you know, we have like, I'm looking at my deal board here in different places. Like, uh, there's Tichy, North Carolina. Um, you know, obviously we got like Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, but there's other like Flintstone, Georgia. I've never seen a Flintstone, Georgia, but yet, <laughs> uh, we did a deal in Flintstone, Georgia. I'm looking at a deal board right now and we made $10,000 on that, on that deal. Uh, um, and it's uh, it's in Flintstone, Georgia. I don't want to say the address because that's a pending deal. I don't want, you know, just in case. But, you know, uh, we did a deal in Ward, Arkansas. I never heard of Ward, Arkansas. I don't know who, who goes to Ward, Arkansas. I tell you, I told my I told my, my, my wife, I said, let's go to Ward, Arkansas. Forget Europe. Forget Spain. And they're like, no, we're not going there. So this maybe the you will go there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we made another deal for $10,000 there. So we get a lot of these little small towns, but we get, you know, we get the bigger areas. Like we have a deal right now in St. Louis, uh, uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. You know, they're all small towns. Byron, Georgia, Red Bowling Springs, Tennessee. I don't know where that is, but you know what? There's money there. So I like money. You know, Bank of America, when you go deposit money, they never ask you where you get your money from. They just care that you have some. So that's my rule. So that's that's interesting. So you target the whole state. You don't do any um, 
like negative searches, you don't block out the bigger cities. You well, you can't keep... do that in Facebook. You okay. can't. Facebook, in the housing market, you in the housing, uh, because we're falling uh, under the housing okay. category, then you're not able to block. So you see, so you have to, it's an, it's an inclusive targeting, meaning you have to select this place, this town, this area, et cetera. And, and you so that's how. Exclude. Okay. You can't exclude. So, so you just have to state, just include. Yeah. Target the whole state and you just kind of catch whatever comes in. Um, exactly. So that makes that makes me curious. What what do you do to train your acquisition team to be to not feel like they have no idea where the heck Ward uh, Arkansas is? So they don't go where, and then they're just like, ah, this person doesn't know us. Well, okay. So there's there's when a lead comes in, right? There's a different layers, right? Number one is. <clears throat> Now, we don't want a lead. Like, for example, there's small towns and then there's completely rural. Rural would be that there is just no sign of life anywhere for a long, a long you know, for a lot in the map, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say a deal comes in in Ward. And so what one of the things we do is we, look, we use mostly Zillow. 99% of the time we use Zillow. So we use Zillow and we look at that area and we zoom out just a little bit. We want what we really want is we want. Even if it's a small area, we want a large, a, a fairly okay population size area within about 30 minutes or so. So we want something close by, you know, and then what we do is we look on Zillow and we look at the actives and we want to see activity. We want to see, you know, either in that small town or the 30 minutes away town. Um, are, are we seeing red dots, meaning that are we seeing active properties? Then what we're doing is we're toggling and seeing, okay, we want to see how many yellow dots. Yellow dots are how many properties have sold, and we say in the last six months, and we want to see activity. When we did that with a deal like, for example, Midland, Texas, we see that, oh, wow, there's a lot of actives and a lot of, and a lot of properties that have sold in the last six months. That means there's life there. At that point, then, we're using Zillow to analyze the, the property. And, you know, we'll use Zillow. We don't really typically use a formula. What we do is we we look at Zillow and we say, like, say, if you have a house and you're offering me the house for a three bedroom, you know, two bath for 50,000, then I'm looking at that market and looking at what what's in that inventory. What else is selling for three bedrooms, two bath? Are these properties rehab? And, and at the end of the day, whatever, when I, as a wholesaler, you need to be you need to be able to offer your customer, which is the end buyer. Uh, your cash buyer, a better product that they could otherwise get themselves. So let's say hypothetically that the three, two that I'm talking with the owner is just like, it needs a ton of work. And I noticed that there's a bunch of other three twos, similar condition that are on the market for $50,000 in that same market, for example. Well, I'm not going to tie up that property for 50 K and add another 10 to try to sell for 60. Why? Because my cash buyer could say, I just go to Zillow and buy whatever's listed on there. So I need to be, uh, be able to offer a better product. So in that scenario, I might say, okay, well, in order for this deal to be viable, I'm going to have to probably get this deal from the seller about 20, 25,000. So then maybe I can offer to cash buyer for 35 and my deal will be better than any other deal that's active for sale right now on Zillow. That's how we approach it. And then we look at the sold and see like, okay, what, what has sold in the last, you know, 30, 60, 90 days and try to figure out, you know, Hey, what the differential is. Um, and then at that point, then we'll put the property on the contract. We put the property in the contract. Um, we typically, we put the property in the contract using hello sign. That's what we use in order to get the digital signatures. Once we get the property in the contract, then we need to get photos. We typically get photos either if the owner lives at the property or the owner's nearby. We typically have the owner, uh, get the photos, uh, using their phone. If we don't, if we can't do that, then we have two options. Number one, we use a service called home jab, uh, that we'll use in order to get property photos. Or number two, we will use a Google Street View and we'll vet the buyers. And the first buyer that we get in there, we'll make a trade with them. I'll say, hey, I'll get you into the property first, Dean, I'll over, but I need a favor. I need you to take some photos for me. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't work. It, it, that's okay too. But if you could at least give me some photos from your cell phone, send them over to me, and that way I'll get you to the front of the line. And a lot of times that works. And and, and also we can use home job, but home job, you know, we got to spend money and everything else. And so if we have a hot buyer, then we'll just send them over there. And then um, in terms of buyers, uh, we use a combination. Predominantly, we use a tool called Investor Lift in order to find our buyers. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we also use Propelio. Investor, Investor Lift is pricey. For somebody just starting out looking to get their first deal, it might be uh, a little bit too pricey. Propelio, not as uh, elegant in terms of their functionality for cash buyers, but 
it still works. So Propelio is a as a, a cheaper alternative. And so we use that in order to find the buyers. We try to stay away from uh, Facebook Marketplace and you know Craigslist, et cetera, uh, at the very beginning, just because you know those type of places in order to find buyers, they tend to bring in a lot of other type of buyers that you know a lot of other it, it, it creates waste. You know we want to we want to ideally work with investors that are already doing deals with wholesalers. They know the deal. They know how we work, and they're looking to buy more deals. That's our target buyer. And then once we have a deal sold, then we will then figure out a title company in that local market. Uh, some people use a national title company or try to use a national title company. We always find that it's always easier for us to use a local title company that knows all the nuances and the ins and outs of dealing with those counties and everything else associated with that. And so we just vet them and make sure that they're investor friendly, et cetera. And that's pretty much, I, I'm giving you like the big picture mm-hmm. overview, yeah, but that's, that's kind of how we... That, that, that's that's how it runs. That's how it runs. Okay. So I got a couple th- a couple questions that come from that. Uh, the first one I want to ask you about is I want you to prove me wrong on something. My you belief- sound like my wife. <laughs> 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 yeah. You, well, yeah. you said you said it in the before the show in uh, when you filled out all the information. You said no softball questions. Give me the hard yeah, ones. Just- that's you it. Said, that's it. You said, "quote unquote," <laughs> throw them at me as if you were a ninja throwing ninja stars. <laughs> you said uh, that. I yes. love that, dude. Was my four submission the best you've seen so far? It's up there. It's up there. I really, I enjoyed that. Uh, I got me excited. So I got some ninja stars for you. Okay, good. Want Let's you to do prove it. me wrong. I, All right. I am a firm believer that being the local market expert is better than being national, than being in multiple locations, because that's what's worked well for me. <laughs> Obviously, I'm yeah. speaking from my experience. Doesn't mean it's the standard or the golden rule. But for me, I've hired local talent okay, versus yeah. virtual. Um, we We know the areas that we're buying stuff. We get a lot of deals from relationships and referrals. <laughs> and so- for me, as I've been teased and uh, and tempted to go to other markets to get low hanging fruit, I've continued to be reinvested back in my market with new marketing strategies, with new relationships, and getting creative to go deeper and wider in my own market. And it's paid off for me. Now, right. maybe I'm missing out, or maybe I'm not. I want I want to hear from you why you think being in multiple locations is the way to go. Yeah. So my question to you is, are you visiting properties physically in order to get the deal signed? Uh, not always. We lead not with always. getting it done virtually. Yeah. And then as part of our due diligence, we'll either have someone on our team or relationships through buyers, similar to the way you explained it. Yeah. Go to these areas that are a little bit further away, but still in our addressable market. Yeah. And- so, so you're, you're, st- you're, you are still kind of doing some virtual, you know, I think, I think at the end, it's the, at the end of the day, it's not necessarily, in my opinion, it's not the fact that you're local. It's, it, it really comes down to the person. If the person on the other side of the seller, you know, here's the thing, the seller at the end of the day has to feel right. Think about this way. The seller has spoken with two or three investors and I've heard some of these calls from investors, people starting out. And you've probably heard some calls and they sound horrible mm-hmm. for any of you listening here. A, a, a great advice is you got to get out. You got to get sales training. You got to get you got to sound like, you know, what the hell you're doing, because when the seller has talked to three or four people and now you get on the phone and you're in our, and, and my favorite book for this is Jordan Belfort's way of, way of the wolf. It's a it, forget about the fact that he did a, bad, a bunch of bad things. It doesn't matter. You <laughs> know, it's forget, like I give the example the like Wall Street. Yeah. You know who I get my knife training from in order to make sure that I can cut my steak <laughs> from Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to be a serial killer. Okay. I, I bet for that, but he, he, he's really good, you know, cutting skills. Right. So I want to learn from it. So you uh, take the good and you leave the bad. Right. Uh, but <laughs> the way of the wolf, one of the things he talks about is when you're on the phone with a, some, with somebody, you got like a very small window of opportunity where you need to sound enthusiastic as hell you need to be mm-hmm. sharp as attack and and the figure of authority. And you come on the phone and you have the right uh, just and that doesn't even have, has nothing to do with the words coming out of your mouth. 
and, and I'll get into that. But if you come out and you and you and the seller, all of a sudden you want the seller to just say, honey, all these idiots, this person that just called me, I think they know what they're doing. This is the guy that's going to buy your house. That will win everything. I don't care if you are virtual, if you're local, if you got your shit together. I don't know if, I, if I'm allowed to, to curse on, on here. Yeah. Am yeah. I allowed to? You yeah. should have told me that at the beginning. I would have cursed <laughs> like a sailor. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've been holding myself back all this time. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you sound like you know what the hell you're doing, then guess what? You're going to get the deal regardless. So I think that that's number one. Number two, the batting percentages do change because in your scenario, I'm sure that you are putting a property in the contract and there's a high probability that you're going to close on that property or going to do something with that property. And it's very unlikely that you're going to go ahead and have to back out of the deal. That has to change for you. If you're going to go like we're doing, our batting average is not going to be that high. Batting average is going to be 50 to 60%, all right? And it's it, it's kind of like that's the business model. So that's one of the things that would need to be adjusted uh, in, terms, in terms of you doing it. But I think that you're doing it already because you're telling me about these uh, areas that are a little bit further away from you, mm-hmm. right? And what we tell the property owner is we tell the property, if, if you're the property owner, say, hey, Dean, the way it works is that we're going to go ahead and send you an agreement. And, and the only reason we're able to buy so many properties nationwide is that we actually have... We, we work with and partner with investors all throughout the country. And these investors are the ones that are actually going to be the boots on the ground. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be, uh, um, uh, be coordinating everything required in order for us to take your property and fix it up. So the way it's going to work is that I'm going to go ahead and send you the agreement. You're going to go ahead and authorize it. Once we get it back, give me a two, uh, give me a few days. And then I'm going to go ahead and call you back. When I call you back, I'm going to go ahead and set up a time for one of our investor partners that's going to come in and take a look at the property. They're going to, you know, listen, I know that the property needs work. Um, and, and so I'm not expecting it to be, you know, completely like brand new, but like, for example, Dean, if you told me that the perfect, the property was perfect. And then last night you had a meteorite that went through your living room and now you have aliens, the ones from other planets, not the ones, you know, that, 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 that the, the, the politicians talk about. If you- that's a bad joke. Uh, if you had aliens in your living room, then uh, that's going to be a problem. I'm not going to be able to pay you when you said you were, you wanted for the property. And, you know, you kid around, but, but but bottom line is I present that, hey, we are going to have our our, our, our investor partner is going to take a look at the deal and they're going to approve it, make sure that they can go ahead and that everything is the way you should be. And that kind of jives with, you know, with the fact that that person is going to end up being the person that's closing on a deal anyway. But I think that at the end of the day, like if you're local and I'm virtual and we're vying for the same house, but if I'm a ninja on the phone, okay, I'm going to run circles around you because I don't care whether you're local or not. It's like I can always twist that around and I can always make it work for me. And if I come across and if the seller feels that, you know what, this guy Chico, I think he's got his act together. That guy, Dean, I don't. I think he just got off the turnip truck uh, two days ago. I'm going to get the deal, not you. So I think it has to do with the person. So that's valid. I, I think uh, from the acquisition negotiation standpoint, yeah. that's that's going to be true. Now, where I see it get challenging, again, I want you to prove me wrong, is that local knowledge, the local relationships with, um, let's call it the title escrow company. Let's call it the buyers, right? These These predetermined relationships you have. If you get it in Timbuktu that you never heard of before, now you got to restart up again and find that new local title escrow company. You got to deal Correct. with potentially it's a, you know, title escrow state or it's an attorney state. Now you're dealing with different things there. Um, now you got to find new buyers and, and trust new people. So just, it's not that it can't be done. It's not that you don't know how to do it. You do it all the time. It's just more effort. So I, I wonder if it's, if it's worth the juice is worth the squeeze. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, that that is a valid point because when you know, unlike a traditional wholesaling model where you're doing deals locally, and so now you have a, a a set of buyers that you're always constantly going to, this is not the case when you're doing it like we do. Because mm-hmm. you know, like right now, I'm looking at my deal board, and 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 every we don't have one particular city that appears uh, twice in this deal board. That means that with all of these, we have to go out and find new buyers. Uh, so that that's that is a negative, right? The positive that we have is just that. Um, you know, we're able to get deals where there's not that much competition. It's a give and take, you know, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm getting deals where there's not that much competition. I'm getting a bunch of inbound leads. And uh, so it's just a different model. So that is a negative. I can't 
I can't say no, I'm going to prove you wrong. That is a negative about the model. Um, and it's just like, I don't know. I had a really bad analogy. It's like if I'm a bank robber and I'm always complaining that uh, people are shooting at me. You're like, Chico, you're in the business of robbing banks. You're always going to have people shooting at you. So it's one of those things. It's just the nature of the beast. All, all of your jokes and analogies around crime, criminal activity. <laughs> are you are you saying that's because I'm Puerto Rican? It's, that's what I was. I, did, I can't say it. You can say it. But, I can uh, say it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's too good. All right. Uh, um, all right. So, but obviously if you have your team set up to do that and you're skilled yeah. around it, then it's not so much an issue. It's part of the business process. You it's know? part of the business process. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So I guess um, one of the things that is interesting that you said that, again, piqued my interest is you're going into areas where there's just less competition. And naturally, a lot of people will say, oh, in my market, it's too competitive. So right. Do you find yourselves find, being able to find a lot of deals as a result of it? I mean, right now, I mean, I'm looking at my my deal board. Right now, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six pending deals. And then we have, in terms of deals that we're trying to market, actively market right now, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, 11, 12, in different stages. Some of them were marketing, some of them we have, uh, all of these are under contract, right? So, I mean, we have more leads than we can handle. I mean, we had a guy that, uh, uh, a friend of mine reached out and says, hey, I'm getting these leads. Would you want to, uh, what if I, I send you my leads and then we all split it? And I said, no, I can't. We we we, we can barely handle the stuff we have because we're inundated. So we can't handle, we, we would need more humans. Uh, yeah. So the the amount of leads, and then, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> You know, everything has its pluses and minuses. The plus with doing digital ads is that if you're, if if you want more leads, all you got to do is just turn the knob. You know, just it's like a like a little stereo. You just turn the knob. If I'm doing cold calling and you want to get more leads, what do you got to do? Got to hire more cold callers. Got to get more lists. You got to do more skip tracing. There's a lot of other things you got to do in order to scale that marketing. With what we're doing online. Facebook and PPC, it's just turning the knob and increasing the campaigns, provided we have the humans in order to be able to accomplish that. So where do you take it from here? Do you continue just perfecting it, adding more states, or are you finding it to be more fun to help other clients out with the same type of strategy? Yeah, so our business, that's a good question. So I'm not... Okay, so I, I run a real estate business for a variety of different reasons. Number one is that I've been in the teaching industry for a very long time. The only way you do that is because you stay relevant. And mm-hmm. the bottom line is you, you produce you produce strategies that work. Because otherwise, then at some point, you'd be called out and say, hey, none of that guy's stuff work. So I have a really good reputation. The only reason being is that we do, we do what we teach. So we're running ads. We're doing deals. Because we want to teach students what we're already what we're already doing. That's number one. Number two, it is an income stream, right? Uh, and the thing is with me is I do the real estate business, but I've always enjoyed more of the teaching business. Even even when um when I was first uh, starting the real estate business, I remember like I was barely ma- making any money. Figured out the postcards, and then all of a sudden, like I went from making a couple thousand dollars a month to like six months later, I made like one hundred ten thousand dollars in a single month, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" But the other thing I realized is that I don't want to talk to any more of these people. They're crazy, <laughs> these sellers. So then, very quickly, this is around two thousand and five. I ended up calling my friends and be like, "Hey, you want in on this? I can do the marketing. I'll teach you how." This is before anybody had acquisitions managers. I was like, "Look, I can't deal with these people, but there's a lot of money here." I can teach you the business. And so I was always the guy behind the scenes running the marketing and doing everything else like that. And so for me, I enjoy that, the marketing and being out there and, and, and having interviews like this with you. I enjoy that side of the business. So, But the, the real estate business is a necessity because, again, we can only teach people what we're already doing because mm-hmm. like you're asking me these questions. The only way that I would know these answers to these questions and, or for you at least to think that I know what I'm doing, or maybe I fooled you would be that we're doing the deals. And so as a client, if you were a client and you asked me all these questions that we need to have the answers for it, because I always think of it this way in the education business, right? It's easy for you to buy my course and 
all I see is a credit card transaction. Oh, he bought my course or signed up with us. And now I got more money in my bank account. But I look at it this way. In that credit card transaction, not just a credit card transaction, you have hopes, you have insp- you have uh, aspirations, you have a lot of different goals in your life that you want to accomplish if you can get this real estate business to work. So I take a, a, a tremendously large level of responsibility with that mm-hmm. because I don't know how much of an impact I have with me. And I know that, hey, maybe you want to send your kids to college. And, and maybe I could help and be a conduit for that. Even just saying that, I get goosebumps uh, thinking about that because for me, I look at it as it's my obligation for me to help you. And I just find it satisfying. Whenever I get an email from somebody say, hey, I was able to quit my job and now I'm no longer working, uh, then to me, that's the most satisfying thing because now I've been able to help somebody else achieve their dream. And uh, to me, that's that's the thing I get the most pleasure from. Yeah, I think that's important. I think two things you said there is relevance. You got to stay relevant. If you're going to be teaching other people, you need to be doing the business. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people out there that aren't doing the business teaching what works when they, they're not testing it out themselves. Um, and like we said, things change. You got to adapt. And yeah. um, so you got to stay relevant. And then you got to find someone that cares about your success as much as you would hope them to be. And so um, I can get I can get that sense from you and um, have always just like seen your passion come through with all the content that I've absorbed over the years mm-hmm. and, and put the work and implement it myself. So um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have you on, man. Uh, appreciate Thank your time. You. Look forward to staying in contact with you more again, everybody that wants to connect with Chris Chico, the legend himself, make sure to check him out at Chris You can Google him, find his YouTube, find his Instagram, all at Chris Chico. And uh, just been a pleasure. Any last words you want to share for the listeners? You know, the last thing I would say is pay equal attention to not only, obviously you're going to pay attention to the strategies that you're trying to figure out to implement your real estate business, but pay equal attention to what's happened in between these ears, right? This brain, because there is a point of diminishing return with real estate information, meaning that at the end of the day, a lot of you, if you consume a lot of information, what's holding you is your belief systems and your habits and your discipline. And so also pay equal attention to that because that also is part of the formula for you to have success. Could not agree more. Well, thank you so much. All right, guys, until next time, peace.